This morning we will finish this first uh, section of the fifth chapter. Uh, as Paul gets into verse 12 that we'll pick up next time we're in Romans, we'll uh, see he changes into a different theme. Not that it doesn't relate. Obviously, it begins with the word wherefore. So it's certainly relating back to all that he said, but he's going to give some specific information related to, to something he hasn't touched upon yet in the text. So uh, we look forward to that. But the verses that we'll look at this morning, verses 9 through 11, are, are the, the summation, if you will, of all that he's been saying in this fifth chapter. And if you've been with us or watching online or whatever, we've been covering this now. I think we've done three. This will be our, this will be our fourth message, I think, in this, these verses. We tried to break it down and help us to understand what's here. And I hope this morning as we try to summarize and, and bring this to a conclusion, the Lord will bless that in our lives as well. Let me read those verses for us if you'd follow along with me in your Bibles. Romans 5, verse 9, Paul says, Much more then... Being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. We're going to look at these verses, try to make uh, see how they relate to the things we've already taught, and, and hopefully be able to grasp this, uh, these concluding thoughts that Paul has here for us. Paul's going to walk us through this passage logically, and that's what I've entitled my message this morning, The Logic of the Gospel. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you would help us in these remaining moments of this service, at least the preaching portion of it, that, Lord, we would be able to come uh, to an understanding of what is being written here by your servant under the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. May we be able to follow his line of reasoning. And as we do, I pray, Lord, that the blessed truth that's here would, would reach into our hearts and lives and, and challenge us. Certainly those that are here today who know Christ, those who are born again, those who are Christians, Lord, may this truth just help uh, reaffirm and, and anchor in their, uh, in their own minds and understandings the incredible blessing they have in, in being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And if there is someone here this morning who has never yet understood their need for Christ or placed their faith in, faith in Him, I pray that somehow through our consideration of these things this morning, your Spirit might even take those truths and uh, bring conviction of sin and bring an awareness of their need for Christ. And we pray that even today might be the day they would put their faith in Him. So Lord, we are... We are needful this morning. We confess that as we come to your word. Uh, Lord, may your spirit open its truth to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think there often exists a misperception concerning the rationality of Christianity. And I think that misperception may be found not only within those who are outside of Christianity as they think about Christianity as an unbeliever and say, that's, you know, that's just not something I would ever want to believe or pattern my life after. I think sometimes it can even be in the lives of professing Christians. There could be many reasons for this, but I think one of the reasons this, this misperception exists is the fact that Christianity speaks so much about the concept of faith. If you've been with us in this study through Romans, you know that we spent several Sundays uh, in chapters 3 and 4 outlining the reality and the necessity of faith. We are saved by grace through faith, and Paul spent many weeks showing us what that meant and the necessity of that faith. And if those of you who have been with us on Wednesday nights, you know that we started a few weeks ago a study into Hebrews chapter 11, which is all about faith and how we walk by faith. So faith is a obviously a, a huge issue within the Scriptures. Faith is spoken up throughout the Scriptures, Old and New Testament. Habakkuk 2.4 is a statement in the Old Testament that is reaffirmed on at least three occasions in the New Testament where the, the prophet said this, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. In Mark chapter 11, verses 22 and 23, Jesus writes and, or says, And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he shall, shall saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. 
Paul, writing to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 7, said this, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul writes to the Ephesian church, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, we haven't gotten there yet on, in our studies on Wednesday nights. Well, there soon, the writer of Hebrews says this, without faith, it is impossible to please him in the context here is speaking of God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, John writes this, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. This is just a small sampling of the testimony of Scripture that remind us of the utter necessity of faith if we would dare call ourselves one of God's children, and certainly in a New Testament sense, if we want to describe ourselves as being Christian. So without question, the basis of our Christianity rests in faith. And so someone might hear that or come to understand that, and they might respond this way, okay, I'm not belittling your faith, choosing what you want to believe in is your prerogative as a human being. But they might add to that, I don't wish or I'm not willing to submit myself to that way of thinking. And they might say this as their reasoning behind that. They might say, I am a person of logic. I'm a person of reasoning. I'm a person of science. They might say, it's okay for you Christians to operate by faith, but I choose to live my life by logical facts. How do we respond to that? How should we take those statements? Are they acceptable to us as believers? Well, they shouldn't be. And I think this is where many non-Christians and even some Christians can go astray. The Bible speaks so much about the necessity of faith. I'm, I'm fearful that we assume that by default that means then there is no logic, there is no reason, there is no science to Christianity. But I would say this morning, dear friend, nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible's call for faith always and only comes in relation to those things that we cannot personally prove or scientifically explain. For instance, it is only by faith, the Scriptures inform us, that we can know God. And the reason that is the case is because God is eternal. He's infinite. He's invisible, just to lose a few of His attributes. Therefore, it is impossible for mortal men, finite men, to know God except by faith. We know who God is because we have faith in God's revelation concerning himself. And as we read, quoted earlier in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And then it's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But how do we know that he is and that he's a rewarder? We know that because of what he has declared to be true concerning himself. It's only by faith that we can understand the ex nihilo creation out of nothing of our universe. We looked at this a few weeks ago in Hebrews 11.3, but since nothing existed before God created it, it is impossible for those things which were created to understand how all things came into existence except by faith. And the writer of Hebrews said that. He said, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. These are just two examples, but they, su they suffice this morning to make the point. As Christians, we are called upon to exercise biblical faith with respect to those things which cannot be personally proven or scientifically explained. By the way, I would just encourage you this morning, if you feel like that puts you at a disadvantage, I would just encourage you with this. The so-called man of reason cannot deny the existence of God and he cannot deny the ex nihilo creation of the universe of God except by faith himself. He cannot scientifically prove that there is no God. And he cannot scientifically prove how the universe came into existence apart from God. He must live by faith just as the Christian lives by faith. Because these are things that can never be quantified. They can never be scientifically proven because they are outside the realm of our capabilities as mortal and finite men. My point of bringing this up this morning is this. Once we have established those things which can only be understood by faith, then the concepts of logic, reason, 
and even rationality do play a role in our lives as Bible-believing Christians. In fact, God himself uses logic as he gives us truth within the Holy Scriptures. And the Holy Spirit, who inspired the human authors of the Scripture, uses logic as he reasons with us concerning the realities of our most holy faith. Our text this morning uses one of these forms of logic. We know that the Apostle Paul had rabbinical training and the rabbis had a name for this particular type of logic. They called it the call wahomar, which literally means light and heavy. This form of logic can actually be used in two different ways. It can be used to argue for something that is lesser to greater or lighter to heavier, if you will. Jesus used this form of logic in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, when he said this, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children... How much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? This was logic that Jesus was using. He's saying, listen, if you're struggling to believe in the goodness of your heavenly Father, then ask yourself this question. Do you as sinful reprobate men ever do good things for your children? And the obvious answer was yes. Well, his point is this. If you on the lesser end, if you as frail sinful men at times do good things for your children, then how in the world can you doubt that our heavenly Father who is righteous and perfect and holy and good would give good things unto his children? It was an argument of logic. It was an argument from the lesser to the greater. It can go the other way as well, though. It can be an argument from the greater to the lesser. And Paul used this and when he wrote to the Corinthians these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says this, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? What was his argument? What was his logic? Paul is telling the Corinthian church that Sabine was was struggling to get along and to deal with issues that were coming up in their church. And obviously by the things he says, they were taking them to the secular courts and trying to let the secular courts work out and iron out the problems within the church. And Paul is amazed. He's, I'm sure he's, he's struggling to believe that Christians would actually do this. And his argument is, what do you not know? Has the scriptures not told us that as God's people, we are going to judge the world one day? That we're going to judge the angels one day? And Paul's point, does not logic dictate then? If God is going to trust you to judge the worlds and judge angels, do you not think you can judge these small, insignificant matters that are going on within your local church? He was using logic to reason with the church at Corinth to understand that they needed to begin exercising ownership of their responsibility to judge in these small, trivial matters within their local assembly. It is this second form of Kal Wahomer that Paul uses to aid these Roman Christians in our text today. If you remember back when we began considering this fifth chapter, we said that the things that Paul was speaking of in this fifth chapter were true of every Christian. And we looked at some of these things over the last few weeks. In other words, we saw this. Because these Romans were justified by faith in Jesus Christ, then Paul said, something is true of every one of them. Every one of them has peace, access, and hope. We also saw this, Paul said, because each of these Romans were justified by faith in Jesus, they were in a position, he said, to rejoice, was the translation that we have in our English Bibles. We said that that Greek word carries the idea of actually boasting. They were able to rejoice in their sufferings because, he said, tribulation brings patience, patience brings experience, experience brings hope, and hope makes unashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which God has given unto us. This is true of Every Christian, every Christian, he says, can come to glory in their sufferings and tribulations because of what God is doing in and through them in their lives as one of his children. And last week, if you were with us, we considered how God demonstrated his incomparable love for every Christian by sending Jesus to die for us while we were yet without strength, ungodly sinners and enemies with him. Every one of these wonderful realities is true, Paul says, of every truly born-again Christian. So in our text this morning, Paul is going to reason with us and seek to help us understand what this then means. And by using this form of logic, Paul will reason that if these incredible realities are true concerning us as Christians, especially considering what it took for God to accomplish these things in our lives, we can then never doubt, we have no reason to doubt God's willingness and ability to fulfill the remaining things he's going to speak of in our text today. 
Paul has two specific things that he wants to draw the Romans' attention to in ours as we study it this morning. So let's just jump right in and see these two things that Paul uses this logic to bring to our understanding. The first is this. Paul is basically saying this. It is only logical that God will ultimately glorify us as Christians. It is only logical that God will ultimately glorify us as Christians. And we see that in verse 9 of our text where he says this, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Now, when Paul begins this, third, this ninth verse with the words, much more, he obviously is referring back to things he's already previously stated. And I think, given the context, it probably relates back to what he has just specifically said in verses 5 through 8 concerning the incomparable love of God for us. And if you were with us last Sunday, as we looked at that and broke down those, those statements, we said this, we would only be able to fully appreciate God's love for us and see how incomparable it actually was by first understanding and owning the greatness of our unloveliness. And Paul gave four terms there that we spent quite a bit of time last week on. We won't spend that kind of time this morning, but I do want to list them, and I've actually quoted them earlier. He said that we were without strength. And as we considered that, we saw that Paul was basically saying we were totally incapable of doing anything ourselves that could ever make us acceptable in the eyes of God. We were sinful in every aspect of our being, and we were therefore, because of that sin, rightly alienated from God and incapable of doing anything to change it. We were without strength. He also said that we were ungodly. In other words, we knew who God was, and we knew what God expected of us, and yet we rejected His authority over us and refused to bend our will to His. And if you remember back several weeks ago, months ago now I guess it was, when we were looking at earlier chapters, we saw that yes, the Jews obviously knew what God expected because they had graciously received the law. They had received the Old Testament teachings. They had been expressly told by God, this is my expectation for you. But Paul said, you Gentiles aren't off the hook <laughs> because God has actually written His law in your hearts. And so that your, your, your thoughts either excuse you or accuse you based upon the decisions you make when you're facing an issue in your life because you are called upon by God to do those things that you innately know to do what is right to do because he's placed that within you. So knowing what God's expectations are, knowing the things that God wants us to do, Paul says, we're ungodly. We reject God. We reject his ways. We reject his authority in our lives. He goes on to say we were sinners. Moral failures. We failed to meet the standard or hit the mark. And we know that God had, had set a proper standard of conduct that he had for all humanity. And we have not measured up to that standard. We have failed. We have actually refused to. We have, as Paul says in Romans, we have fallen short of the glory of God. And then lastly, we saw, and Paul stated that we were enemies. That's actually in our text this morning, verse 10, but we lumped it in because it's one of the things we need to understand was true concerning us. And we saw that we were actually at enmity with God. We said last week, the reality of this is this. If it was possible, if we could physically drag God from his throne and remove any of his sovereign authority he has over us in our lives, we would do it. We said this, if we could put God to death, we would. That was proven when the world rose up against Jesus and put him to death. Our attitude toward God is this. God, would you just go away and leave me alone? I don't want a God. I refuse to serve a God. I refuse to acknowledge your authority in my life. Just go away. That's our attitude. That's our enmity with God. As we looked at this last week, we saw this was the ugly yet accurate picture of who we are. And yet Paul informed us, in spite of all of this, God loved us. And God's love for us was so great that while we were yet sinners, Paul informed us, Jesus died for us. This love of God was not the love that fallen man occasionally demonstrates here on earth. And he gave that example that sometimes a person will die in the place of another righteous person. Or sometimes a person will even dare to die for a good person. No, Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners, devoid of any good, any righteousness in our lives. And we also saw that God's love was not demonstrated through the act of a sinful man dying for another sinful man or a mortal man dying for another mortal man. We said, you know, yeah, sometimes you know, 
somebody's got to die in a situation and there might be somebody that says, well, I'm getting on in airs. I've had a long, full life. I, you know, let's let the younger people live. Or maybe the man says, I'll sacrifice my life that my, my wife and children might live and go on. And, and that's noble and it's good. And I'm not saying that's not love, but there are obviously uh, extenuating circumstances that would cause us to make that decision. It's, it's immortal. I'm not going to live forever anyway, so I'm, I'm going to give up my, my remaining days right now for the sake of someone else. But that was not the death that happened here on our behalf by Jesus Christ. No, God's love was demonstrated to us when the sinless Son of God died upon the cross for sinners like you and like me. It was God's love being demonstrated by the Creator dying for the creation. It was God's love, and it, we saw, is an incomparable love. There is no love like it in all the earth, and there never will be a love like it in all the world. Therefore, Paul says, or much more, he says in our verse, verse 9, much more then, being now justified by his blood, by Jesus' blood, Paul says, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Don't lose sight of the logic. He's using this logical progression of the greater to the lesser. What's he saying? He's basically saying this. If we are now justified by the blood of Jesus, and again, he wants them to remember all that that entailed, all that had to happen for this to be the case. If we are now justified, if that's the greatest thing that God had to do and the greatest thing that he did do, Paul says, we shall then be saved from wrath through him. That's a lesser thing. That's something that's not as difficult for God to do based upon what he's already done for us. I think when he speaks of the wrath here, Paul must be implying the ultimate wrath of God, which lost men will experience when they are cast into the lake of fire and brimstone at the return of Jesus Christ in judgment. And so in his logic here, Paul is saying, logic would dictate to us that if God has already justified us through the faith that we have in Jesus, if he's declared us righteous, if he's expunged our record, he will without doubt see to it that we are not eternally damned in the final judgment. What logical sense, Paul is saying, would it make for God to allow his son's sacrifice to have gone in vain? What good would Christ's sacrifice have been if it could not totally save those who have placed their faith in? In him. So Paul says it would be totally irrational for God to fail to fulfill his salvation promises to us given what it cost him to justify us in the first place. We therefore, as Paul wrote to the Philippians, can have all confidence that he which hath begun a good work in us shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. That's only logical. God will not fail. Given what it took for him to declare us righteous, there is no way, no logically way we could possibly entertain the thought that God now is going to fall down on the job, he's going to fail to do, or he's going to be incapable of performing that ultimate act that we need, which is to preserve us in the day of his ultimate wrath. That's his first point here, his first logical reasoning that he gives in his text. But he has one other one he wants to bring out as well, and that is this. Paul, in essence, is saying it is only logical that God will save us now that we are rightly related unto him. It is only logical that God will ultimately save us now that we are rightly related unto him. And he says that in verse 10. He says this, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I'm sure probably maybe everyone in this room this morning understands that there are different tenses, if you will, to the concept of salvation in the Scripture. If I were to ask you this question this morning, if I were to ask you, are you saved, and you are a born-again Christian this morning, you could actually answer that question in three different ways, and they would all be true. You this morning, if I say, are you saved, you could answer me, yes, I am saved. And by stating your answer that way, you would be referring to the fact that at the moment you placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were justified. You were declared righteous by God the Father. We could say it this way, you were saved from your sin. In this very book of Romans chapter 10, Paul will write this later. We will look at it. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In other words, the moment that someone cries out to Jesus in saving faith, he has the assurance of God and his word that he will be saved. So if I ask you this morning, are you saved and you are a born again Christian, you could honestly answer that question. Yes, I am saved. 
But if I ask you this question this morning, are you saved? As a born-again Christian, you could also answer me this way. I am being saved. By stating it this way, you are informing the person who is asking the question that God is presently saving you. He's presently, one of the test, one of the words the Scripture uses, is sanctifying you. He is presently weaning all of the sinful elements out of you and conforming you to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Paul said it this way in his letter to the Corinthians. He said this, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Isn't that interesting? Paul's writing that to Christians. He's writing that to people who have already placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And yet Paul's testimony to them is this. He says, you know the sufferings that God is bringing into our lives as your apostles and spiritual leaders? Do you realize that by doing this, what God is doing in our lives, and as you witness this, and as we minister to you through this, God is actually bringing to bear your consolation and your salvation. In other words, God is using it to save you. And we could say it this way. God's using it to sanctify you. To, trans, to, to continually transform you into the image of Jesus Christ, to make you not what you were, and to make you what God is redeeming you to be. So you could honestly say, if I asked you, are you saved? You could say, yes, I'm saved, past tense, because it's happened. When you trusted Christ, you were justified. You could honestly answer, I'm being saved, because right now God is sanctifying you. He is transforming you through the power of Jesus Christ. But thirdly, if I asked you this question, are you saved this morning? You could honestly, biblically answer this way, I will be saved. I will be saved. And by stating it this way, you would be speaking of your ultimate glorification in Jesus, the completion of God's salvation plan in your life. Again, Paul writing to the Romans, we'll get there someday, in Romans chapter 13, we'll write this, and that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of our sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. <laughs> what? Wait a minute, I thought the moment we believed we got saved. Well, we do, that's a biblical truth. But Paul says your salvation is nearer than the day that you did believe. What is he saying? He's saying that there is coming an ultimate salvation, if you will, that time when God completes the salvation purpose in your life. Redemption will be brought to its culmination. This is going to obviously be with the return of Jesus Christ. And it's when we are going to actually even lose the remaining vestiges of, of the sin curse because this, this earthly mortal body is going to be laid aside. And if we've been dead already and we've been separated from our bodies, we're going to gain our new glorified bodies as we meet Christ in the air. But if we are alive on the earth at this time, the Bible clearly teaches to the, in Thessalonians that we're going to actually be transformed transformed, metamorphosis is going to take place as we are caught up in the air to meet the Lord. We are going to be transformed in this, even this sinful remnant of my body is going to be transformed into the glorious body of Jesus himself. So we will be saved. This hasn't happened yet, but it's coming and we're assured of it. So if I said, are you saved? You could honestly answer, I will be saved. And so in our text this morning, what is Paul referring to? As he argues from the greater to the lesser, as he uses this logic, he's basically saying this. You know what? If God was willing and able to reconcile us to himself when we were his enemies, all right? And this he did, obviously, if we've trusted Jesus as our Savior. Then Paul says logic would certainly dictate that God will ultimately save us now that we are his friends. Now that we have been reconciled unto him. So Paul says, we were reconciled to God through the death of Jesus, and now Paul says, we are reconciled to God. We who are reconciled to God will be saved by the life of Jesus. Seems to me that Paul is probably referring by that statement to the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the basis for our future hope of glorification. And Paul is saying that it would be irrational for God, who has already reconciled us through Jesus' death, to now fail to glorify us through his life, seeing we are now rightly related to him as his friends. So do we see the logic in these two statements? Do we see what Paul is using to reason with these Roman believers? He says two things. 
If when we were ungodly sinners, God was willing to sacrifice His precious Son to bring about our justification, then, arguing from the greater to the lesser, God will certainly, undoubtedly, now spare us from the wrath to come, since we have already been declared righteous through our faith in Jesus. And in verse 10, he's arguing, and since God was willing to reconcile us to Himself through the death of His Son, He broke through the enmity and rightly related us to Him through our faith in Christ, it would be totally illogical for God now to fail to glorify us since he now counts us as his children, as he counts us as his friends, as he counts us as those who have been reconciled to him. Paul says it's illogical to think it could happen any other way. As he concludes this section in verse 11, he has one more thing he wants to add to his teaching, and we'll look at it here. He says, and not only so, not only are these things undoubtedly true, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. As we look at this 11th verse, I just want to draw our attention to two words here and, 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 and just bring them out so we make sure we're understanding the same thing. The, the word joy that's, that's translated joy here in our text is the very same Greek word we've met before. We met it in verse 2, it was translated rejoice, and we met it in verse 3 is the word glory. Remember those verses? Verse 2, by whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And in verse 3 he said, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. We spoke with that word, we, we broke it down, we saw that the, the essence of that Greek word is really boasting, almost a sense of pride. It's the very same Greek word that he uses here, and not only so, but we also joy. We could say it this way, we rejoice, we could say it this way, we boast, we glory, Paul says, in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the second word I bring to our, our, our attention is the last word, which is Translated atonement in our text. It is the same Greek word in noun form of the verbs reconciled in verse 10. So in verse 10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved for His life. It's the same Greek word that he uses down here. Our King James translators have chosen to translate it atonement. I'm not exactly sure why they did. I'm sure they had a great reason for doing so. But I just want to make sure we understand it's the same word. It's the same term in the Greek. So we really, honestly, without any, in any way uh, changing the text in any meaningful way or, or, or you know, being disingenuous, we could, we could paraphrase verse 11 this way. And not only so, Paul says, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received reconciliation. So that's what he's saying. Paul is saying what? Why does he bring this 11th verse in? He's basically saying, in addition to the truth of the logic he has just revealed concerning our salvation as Christians, Paul says, we are now in a position, because it's his truth, to do even more. He says, we as Christians can boast in God. We as Christians can glory in God. We as Christians can rejoice in God. Joy in God. Why can we do this? Because through Jesus, he says, we have been reconciled to God. When you think about this concept of reconciliation, we need to understand that mankind is in need of reconciliation in both directions. Unsaved man, sinful man, is at enmity with God. Therefore, he needs to be reconciled to him. Paul in Romans chapter 8 will say, the carnal mind is at enmity with God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So we as sinful man, we are at enmity with God, all right? We're at hostility with God. Therefore, we need to be reconciled because previously we've been living a life of hostility toward God. But the Bible also informs us that there needs to be reconciliation from God to us because God is presently at enmity with sinful men. Romans chapter 1, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Wait, wait a minute. No, God loves the world. Yes, he does. But he's at wrath with the world too. He's angry with the world. He's at enmity with the world. Why? Because the world is living in sinful rebellion against him. So this reconciliation is needed not only on our part, we're enemies with God, we need to be reconciled to Him, but it's needed in the other direction because God's at, at enmity with man. His wrath is abiding upon us because of our sin. We need reconciliation both ways. And you know what? That reconciliation has been accomplished through Jesus Christ. Writing to the Corinthians, Paul said this, what glorious verses, many of us have read them many times, but in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul wrote this, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
Old things are passed away. That would be a lot of things. But one of the things we could say is that enmity, it's passed away. And all things are become new. And all things, he says, are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And then Paul said, he's even entrusted to us, speaking of himself, but certainly by implication it comes to other Christians as well. He says he's given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto, the wor- unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And then he tells us how it could happen. For he, God, hath made him Jesus Christ to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Reconciliation. And Paul says in verse 11, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement, or I think just so we keep the thought process in line with what he's been saying, we have received this reconciliation. We've been made right with God, and God has been made right with us. So let me ask you a question this morning, dear friend. Is God your friend? Is he your friend? Have you been reconciled to God? Has that enmity been broken? Has that hostility against God? Pastor, I've never been mean to God. I don't know, what do you call this? Looks pretty mean to me. That looks pretty mean to me. I'm not listening. I'm not doing. I'm going to do my own thing. That seems pretty hostile to me, especially considering who it is. Imagine earthly parent. If you came to your child and said, this is what I want to you, and they said, You would think of that as hostility, wouldn't you? You would think of that as enmity. You would think, uh, I think we need some reconciliation here. God has prescribed a way to bring such reconciliation to pass, right? Let's go out to the woodshed. Let's get reconciled. But you know what? It can go the other way, too. And in the sense of our salvation, it was true. God, wrath, was being revealed from heaven against us. He was at enmity with us, and rightfully so, because of our enmity with him. Has your enmity with God been broken? And are you confident that God's enmity with you has been broken? Are you now rightly related to God? Is he truly your friend? Have you been reconciled? Paul says, if we have... (laughs) If we have been, we can joy. We can rejoice. We can boast in the reality of this reconciliation that we have with God through Jesus Christ. And Paul says, the logic then is this. If God was willing to declare you righteous through your faith in his son, even when you were a sinner, even when you were at enmity, then you can have confidence that he will surely save you from the wrath to come now that you've been justified through Jesus And since God was willing to reconcile you to himself through the death of his son, you can now know, you can have confident assurance that he's going to ultimately glorify you in the end because you're his friend. That's the logic of the gospel. And Paul says it should be the thing that every Christian boasts our glories in. Remember as we headed into chapter 5, we said this, everything that Paul really writes from this point forward is true of every Christian. Christian. This isn't the testimony of the super Christians. This isn't the testimony of the privileged of God. No, this is the testimony of every person who has been justified by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Are you saved this morning? Well, I am saved. I'm being saved. I will be saved. Is that you this morning? Then this is true of you. You can glory and boast in the reconciliation that God has brought to you. And you can live day by day in the confident assurance, you know what, I don't need to fear the future. I don't need to fear the return of Christ. I don't need to fear the judgment that is to come because I'm rightly related 
to God. I've been reconciled to Him through Jesus Christ. This is the logic of the gospel. Lay hold of it. Make it yours. Father, this morning I pray you challenge us with these thoughts. Lord, I pray the, the truth. I know sometimes maybe we, we get fearful of using terms like logic. No, Pastor, I don't want to rest in logic. I want to rest in faith in the truth of God. Okay, that's what we're doing. This is your truth. But it's been given to us in logical form. And Paul is saying, reason with me. Let's think through this. This is what God is doing. This is what God is committed to doing. And this is why he's committed to doing it. And as we begin to understand what Paul is saying here is true, may we lay hold of it and make it our own. And Lord, may it be that truth that encourages us and strengthens us and aids us and helps us as we live day by day in a sin-cursed and fallen world, as we operate around people who are at enmity with God and that God is still at enmity with them. As we go through this daily morass, may we be able to comfort and encourage our hearts by the knowledge of what is true concerning us, simply because by your grace we have had faith in Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, work in our hearts, I pray this morning in this area. In Jesus' name, amen.